welcome to Debakey CV Education. I'm your host, John Cook. I'm chair of the Department of Cardiovascular Sciences here at Houston Methodist Research Institute. And uh, with me today is a special guest, uh, Dr. Reza Ardahali. Dr. Ardahali is a professor at UCLA. He's a cardiologist, he's a heart failure specialist. He does basic research in cardiovascular regeneration. And we just heard uh, <coughs> an amazing lecture from him. And we'll have a little conversation now about uh, uh, the general topic of cardiovascular regeneration, stem cells in the heart. Um, Dr. Ardahali uh, was uh, trained uh, at uh, Emory, Johns Hopkins, at Stanford. He was there as a cardiovascular fellow uh, before he became uh, an associate professor at, uh, at UCLA. Uh, welcome to our version of Hollywood. Thank you, Dr. Houston. Cook. Thank you. Yeah, it's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, so we were talking today about, uh, you were talking today about stem cells in the heart. Uh, can you, you start by telling us a little bit about stem cells generally? Uh, what yeah. is a stem cell? Yeah, that, that's a great question. Maybe we can start uh, with the basics of, uh, of, a, uh, of the properties of stem cell and what defines a stem cell. Uh, stem cell is defined by having two unique properties. That one is it's capable of generating daughter cells that are unique and equivalent to, to the parental cell. And the other is it's, uh, a stem cell is capable of differentiating into different tissue types. Mm -hmm. So in order to meet the criteria to be named a stem cell, um, they have to possess these two uh, properties. As far as we know, the cardiac um, in the heart, mm -hmm. uh, we have not been able to identify the, um, the tissue stem cells. Now, the question, uh, one has to ask the question, what are the different types of um, stem cells? And we can go into that. There, uh, the major categories of stem cells are tissue stem cells, meaning that specific organ or tissue has residing stem cells even in, 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 in an adult organism. So an this, example, is a, this is a stem cell in, in the tissue, in the organ. Correct. That can then, it can then regenerate the tissue? Is that what you're saying? That's exactly correct, okay. that it can renew itself and it can also regenerate the tissue. Mm -hmm. An example, a good example of this uh, tissue stem cell is the hematopoietic stem cell. Mm -hmm. And that is well characterized, it's been well known, and it's been clinically utilized. The hematopoietic stem cell, it's, uh, it's, it resides in the bone marrow, and it's capable of renewing itself, and it's capable of generating new blood cells and it has been clinically utilized for transplantation, bone marrow transplantation, where a, the stem cells are uh, transplanted into, into a new patient to generate new blood uh, forming colonies. So there's a stem cell therapy that works, that's exactly. accepted. Um, it, the <clears throat> hematopoietic stem cell in, in the bone marrow can regenerate uh, the bone marrow. Uh, Absolutely. So this is a great clinical example of the utility of stem cell in treating patients. Now, besides tissue stem cells, there are other types of stem cells. One is embryonic stem cells. And these are the cells that are taken from a fertilized uh, embryo where cells at the blastocyst stage are taken out and they, they are cultivated in vitro, meaning in a dish. And so these, these are the cells that, the, after fertilization of the egg, they're the first few cells that form exactly. um, that ultimately become you know, the three trillion cells that are us, I guess. Absolutely, mm -hmm. and that's why we call them uh, pluripotent stem cells, meaning that they're capable of generating all the tissue types. These are the cells that can also generate a new organism. And so they're different then from the, the tissue stem cells. I guess the tissue stem cells are, can just regenerate that tissue, but the embryonic stem cell, that can become any tissue. That's exactly correct. And we can, we can categorize this in a hierarchy uh, with totipotent, these are the terms that are used, totipotent stem cells are the cells that can generate an organism. Pluripotent uh, stem cells are the cells that can generate all the tissue types in an organism. And multipotent uh, progenitors that can make, make up the different types of cells within an organ um, that would be a hematopoietic stem cell. A hematopoietic stem cell is considered to be multi potent uh, stem cell because it can generate the different types of uh, immune cells and blood cells. Now, 
the embryonic stem cells that we refer to uh, that has been well established and well studied and well accepted by the regulatory um, uh, committees. Uh, these are called human embryonic stem cells that are well established and used by different researchers. Uh, these are pluripotent stem cells and they, they can be cultivated in a dish to generate different tissue types, including cardiomyocytes. Mm -hmm. Um, now we've talked about tissue stem cells, we've talked about embryonic stem cells. There's another type of uh, stem cells called induced pluripotent stem cells. And these are the cells that are generated in vitro, meaning in a dish, by taking somatic cells, for example, blood cells or fibroblasts from a skin biopsy, and by exogenously transferring and expressing certain transcription factor or certain, certain genes, they can be reversed back to a more um, uh, primitive state. Mm -hmm. And these can be brought back to a pluripotent stem uh, cell state. That's amazing. I, I guess it was, if I recall correctly, it was Shinya Yamanaka, a Japanese scientist who got the Nobel Prize for this discovery, right? That you mm -hmm. could take a little piece of skin from a person and culture those cells and then overexpress just four genes. That's tr correct. Uh, OC4, SOX2, KL4, CMYK, overexpress those genes and that over time that skin cell would become an induced pluripotent stem cell yes. capable of becoming anything. Absolutely correct, yeah. And these induced pluripotent stem cells are considered to be equivalent, uh, although not identical, to embryonic stem cells. Mm -hmm. And again, they can be cultivated, as you, as you, as you said, in, in a dish and generate all different tissue types, including cardiomyocytes. Mm -hmm. Now, um, <coughs> these cells, the, the embryonic stem cells or the induced pluripotent stem cells, can be used not only as a model to study organ development in a dish, they can also be used as a source for tissue regeneration. Mm -hmm. However, I should mention that uh, currently there are no proven uh, therapy to use these induced pluripotent stem cells or human embryonic stem cells to treat cardiovascular disease. So let's let's jump to that now. We've talked about stem cells. Um, there was there's been a lot of excitement about stem cell therapy for heart disease for cardiovascular disease. Um, tell us a little bit about, about that. What what set the stage for cardiovascular stem cell therapy? Yeah. So cardiovascular stem cell therapy um, has a history of about uh, almost two decades now, going back into the uh, early 2000s, when uh, a number of investigators uh, decided or uh, they thought that taking uh, stem cells from the hematopoietic system, from the bone marrow, uh, they may have the plasticity, plasticity to generate uh, cardiomyocytes or the building blocks of the heart. Uh, so a number of investigators took uh, bone marrow cells, uh, they took other type of cell types including other progenitors which are um, uh, the, the primitive type of cells that have the uh, capability of maturing to, to a committed cell type and they transplanted these into the heart. Mm -hmm. So a typical uh, trial that, uh, that would take patients, uh, aspirate their bone marrow, mm -hmm. and they would do some in vitro cultivation, they would um, uh, process them, and they would s inject them back into the heart of, of, uh, of the patient. So these were stem cells from the bone marrow. Uh, that's correct. And if, if I recall correctly, the, the, the animal studies that were done uh, were promising. Uh, there seemed to be some improvements. Tell us a little bit about that. Just what was done to set the stage for the human trials? Right. So it started with some uh, animal studies by taking bone marrow cells from the animals and injecting them into the heart and seeing some improvement in the function of the heart. Uh, however, none of these studies showed that these bone marrow cells have the ability to transform into cardiomyocytes or the building uh, blocks of the heart. But maybe Meaning, they were making something that could improve heart function in, that's in these animal models of heart attack and heart yeah. failure. And that's the current thought that even if they don't have the ability to change into cardiomyocytes, they may have the ability to excrete certain factors mm -hmm. that would promote the healing of the heart. Mm -hmm. And this led to a rush of clinical trials, as we uh, talked about, uh, by taking bone marrow aspirate from patients mm -hmm. or taking their peripheral blood and mm -hmm. processing them in vitro and transplanting it in, in, into the heart. And the initial clinical trials were somewhat uh, promising, although inconsistent. 
and uh, it raised a lot of excitement that mm -hmm. there could be a stem cell therapy for the heart. Those initial studies also led to the, the government investing in in, in this, these studies of stem cell therapy, right? The National Institutes of Health put a lot of su a su substantial amount of money yeah. into uh, trials of uh, stem cell therapy for the heart. Tell us briefly about that. Yeah, so it, it created a network of different, uh, in, uh, different uh, academic centers and different hospitals to come together and perhaps standardize their approach to stem cell therapy from, from the bone marrow. And these studies were key factors in uh, our current understanding of, of the uh, approach for stem cell therapy for the heart. And they showed that the majority of these trials, um, uh, they showed that there was no uh, uh, long-term improvement and no mm -hmm. long-term benefit from the transplantation of mm -hmm. these cells. So a lot we of know, money, a lot of investigators, a lot of time uh, in done, carefully done studies yes. using bone marrow-derived cells from the heart, uh, from, from bone marrow-derived cells into, into the heart, the heart yeah. um, failed to show much benefit in people that had a heart attack or people that had heart failure. Yeah, mm -hmm. um, that's absolutely correct. And this, pro this process led to standardization of the, of the protocols and it was a very well, these were very well designed experiments. So we and did learn a lot trials. about yes. how to do a stem we cell did trial. Learn, yeah, we did learn, but I would say that the biggest uh, takeaway from this is that we learned that these cells from the bone marrow have no ability to become cardiomyocytes. Yeah. They may provide, they may change the microenvironment to promote the healing of the heart, but they don't make new cardiomyocytes. So, so that was disappointing, but we, we learned something. Yes. Um, what's next? So next is the heart, I should say, from a historical perspective, heart was considered to be a terminally differentiated organ, meaning that you're born with certain number of cardiomyocytes uh, in the heart and you die with those numbers. And in, the, in, in your lifespan, in one's lifespan, if there's damage to the heart and you lose cardiomyocytes, that leads to replacement by scar and remodel, adverse remodeling leading to heart failure. But there is new data sh suggesting that there may be a very, very low rate of cardiomyocytes undergoing division. And this happens mainly during the neonatal period. And one of the areas of uh, intense research is to identify those factors that lead to, lead to uh, re-entry of cardiomyocytes to cell cycle activity, meaning- So I guess that what, that what that means is getting the cells, the heart cells to start dividing again- Exactly. To replace damaged cells. Right. Whereas in, in an adult heart, when the cells die after a heart attack, when the cardiomyocytes uh, die after a heart attack, it's replaced by, uh, by a scar. The hope is the remaining viable cardiomyocytes, if they can be induced to, to undergo proliferation and division so that they can replace the, the, uh, the injured uh, heart. That's one approach. The other approach that certain investigators, including us, uh, have taken is taking exogenous cells and trying to see if we can make cardiomyocytes in a dish and then transplant them into the heart. And one of the sources that we have used is pluripotent stem cells, whether it's induced pluripotent stem cells or human embryonic stem cells. Uh, and we've started generating cardiomyocytes and we've tried to mature them so that they can be, upon transplantation, they can engraft and integrate with mm -hmm. the host myocardium and improve the cardiac function. We're at the stages of doing preclinical studies in large animals, and they are, um, they are very promising. However, I should say that this is nowhere close to taking it into uh, clinical practice. Mm -hmm. uh, another uh, approach that certain investigators have taken is uh, there are different types of uh, cells in the heart. Mm -hmm. uh, the supporting cells of the heart are called fibroblasts. These mm -hmm. are the cells that excrete extracellular matrix to maintain the ar architecture of the heart and the connectivity between cardiomyocytes. So they're like Upon the skeleton, they form the exactly. skeleton they of the heart. They form the skeleton of the heart. 
but they have an additional role and that is in response to injury they get activated and they produce significant amount of extracellular matrix and they contribute to fibrosis and scar formation. Mm -hmm. Their so numbers these are, these increase. These are the cells that form a scar. Exactly. Of, uh, if, when a heart is injured. Yeah, these are fibroblasts that form fibrosis and the scar of the heart and their number increase in response to injury because they are participating in, in scar formation. One approach that a number of investigators have taken uh, is trying to see if we can take advantage of these, these uh, abundant fibroblasts and try to turn them into cardiomyocyte-like cells. Hmm. So basically, we're, we're changing the fate of one cell that is abundant in response to injury uh, that's, re that's leading to fibrosis and making them into cardiomyocyte-like mm -hmm. cells so that we can remuscularize the scar So how area. do you do that? How do you take a fibroblast, which is, which is its role is to make a scar, yeah. how do you t take a fibroblast and convince it to become a functioning heart cell that's contracting? Yeah, this all comes from our experience and our, uh, the contribution from the pioneers of induced pluripotent stem cells. So what they thought, what they did was taking a somatic cell like a fibroblast and overexpress specific genes that are important in determining the fate of a cell and reverting it back to another state. Mm -hmm. So in induced pluripotent stem cell, you take a fibroblast and you overexpress certain transcription factors and it goes back to a pluripotent state. Now, same thing can be done with fibroblasts in the heart and overexpressing certain transcription factors and reverting back, reverting back them back into a cardiomyocyte-like cells. So these, these uh, transcription factors, I guess it sounds like they're the master regulators of Absolutely. cell identity. So yes. if you know what the master regulators are of cell identity and you can get those into an a different cell, you can turn that cell into what you want. So you're saying you can turn fibroblasts yes, yes. into cardiomyocytes if you understand what the master regulators of yeah. cardiomyocyte identity are. And these master regular, regulators have been identified by different investigators, mm -hmm. by some of the pioneers in this field. And How do you get them into a cell? How do you get the master regulators into a yes. cell? Yes, so in, in a dish, we usually use a virus, and the virus can have the overexpression of these, uh, of these um, uh, master regulators, these genes. The virus can get into the cell and this, it can carry exactly. the genes in that you put into the virus. Right, okay. so what we do, we make a virus, we put these genes in the virus with a, um, that overexpresses it. Once the virus gets into a cell, uh, these genes get activated and they are overexpressed, therefore making these uh, So you're using a cells. virus as a vehicle. As a vehicle, mm -hmm. yeah. But currently, there, there's advancement in this field that you don't have to use a virus. People have used proteins, people have used RNAs, uh, modified RNAs to overexpress certain mm -hmm. um, genes to, uh, to change the identity of the cells. So the hope is that in the future, you can even use small molecules mm -hmm. that you can, um, in response to an injury, when the fibroblasts are activated to proliferate and make the, uh, the scar, you can, you can target those fibroblasts and rather than them becoming a scar, they become cardiomyocytes and repopulate and remuscularize Wow, that's exciting. The so the idea yeah. would be instead of getting a scar, get real tissue. Exactly. Um, you know, uh, there's, there are still some, some groups pursuing cell therapies, um, bone marrow derived cell therapies. And, uh, it's been thought, said that, you know, maybe the reason the uh, original trials failed was because we were using the wrong uh, bone marrow derived cells or the bone marrow derived cells from that person that had the heart attack they're sick also yeah. and, and maybe maybe we can enhance the, the cell therapy somehow to to improve upon it yeah. any thoughts about that yeah so from what we have learned from these clinical trials and also other areas of developmental biology I think we have come to the conclusion that the plasticity of certain cells um, it, uh, it's, it's very difficult to prove the plasticity of certain cells that they change their fate and become something else unless some exogenous factors are added. So um, I'm convinced that cells that are taken from the bone marrow or cells that are taken from the peripheral blood, if they're put into the heart, they will never become heart cells unless something is done to them. Uh, unless certain uh, transcription factors, for example, are overexpressed in them. 
the master regulators. Yes. Uh, however, having said that, one cannot exclude the possibility that there are paracrine effects, meaning that by transplanting these cells, it may change the microenvironment that would promote the repair of the, of the myocardium. And my hope is that that our science will advance enough that rather than doing the cell therapy, we can identify mm -hmm. what are these factors that promote healing. Mm -hmm. And we develop pharmacologic agents that would do the same thing as the, as the cell therapy. Beautiful. Well, it sounds like there's still hope for stem cell therapies. It may be, take a different form than, than it has in the past. Maybe factors derived from the stem cells, uh, yeah. uh, or maybe modifying the cells that are already there Absolutely. so that they can be become regenerative. Well, this has yeah. been just a, a fascinating uh, to talk to you about this, and and uh, really thank you so much for thank you very much for again. for having me. Yes, thank you. And um, thanks for joining us again on uh, DeBakey's CV Education. See you soon.